a typical American college student now focuses for only 65 seconds. A different study by Professor Larry Rosen, they just observed college students when they're focusing and they found they couldn't focus for more than a few minutes without breaking away. Now we can all see why that's a really big problem. So I write a lot in the book about why this has happened to our kids and what we can do about it. And one of the causes is exactly what you say. We have enormously deprived our children of exercise. Only 73% of elementary schools have any form of recess, for example. Welcome to the Spartan Up podcast with Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. Has your focus been stolen? Johan Hari, author of Stolen Focus, talks to Joe DeSena about the reasons you and the people around you may be having trouble with your focus and what you can do about it. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by USANA Health Sciences, driven to innovate and advance the science of nutrition. Visit USANA.com to learn more about their incredible selection of nutritional supplements and healthy lifestyle products. Joe DeSena here, CEO and founder of Spartan and the Spartan Up podcast, where we attempt, no, actually we do, rip you off the couch, give you a motivation, a little kick in the ass. I've got Johan Hari on here. He's going to teach us, you're going to teach us how to focus. You got a new book. What's the book called? Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again. Why can't we pay attention? This is what I spent four years researching because I noticed that every year that passed, Things that required deep focus, like reading a book, were for me getting more and more like running up a down escalator. You know what I mean? It was, I could still do it, but it was getting harder and harder. And I noticed this was happening to a huge number of people I knew. I was particularly worried about the young people in my life, a lot of whom seemed to be kind of whirring at the speed of Snapchat, when nothing still or serious could touch them. So I used my training in the social sciences at Cambridge University to start to investigate this. And even very early on, some of the, the facts I uncovered early on really startled me. For every child who was identified with serious attention problems when I was seven years old, there's now a hundred children who've been identified with serious attention problems. The average American office worker now focuses on any one task for only three minutes. So to figure out what's going on and most importantly how we can put it right, I went on a big journey all over the world from Miami to Melbourne to Moscow and I interviewed over 200 of the leading experts on focus and attention and I did a really deep dive into the science and research that they've uncovered and I learned that there's scientific evidence for 12 factors that are screwing up my ability to focus, your ability to focus, our kids' ability to focus and loads of those factors that are damaging our attention and focus have been really rising in recent years. This is, if you're struggling to focus and pay attention, you're not alone, it's not your fault. This is being done to us by these big forces and we're gonna have to take, we're gonna have to respond in two ways. We've gotta play defense, we've gotta defend ourselves and our kids and we've gotta play offense, we've gotta go, we've gotta take on the forces that are doing this to us because your attention didn't just collapse, your attention's been stolen from you. Partly by tech, that's the first thing people think of, but actually by a huge array of forces that go way beyond tech, from the food we eat, to the sleep we don't get, to the hours we overwork. And it connects with your work, Joe, in all sorts of ways, particularly around exercise, how we prevented our kids from moving around. This is profoundly damaging their attention. So I think there's loads of areas of overlap between the brilliant work you're doing and some of the things that I've uncovered for Stolen Focus. As you're talking, um, there's a few things that come to mind. One is, I definitely have attention deficit disorder. And um, the author, the Edison gene, argues that really when we were hunter gatherers, um, we monitored our environment. We, we were scanning the environment for a potential threat, uh, for potential food. And, um, and then we became an agrarian society where we, we sit around, we planted a seed, and we waited for our food to grow. Right. But there's some people that still have those old hunter gatherer genes, probably more of an entrepreneur, um, right, more of a, a person. And so I I'm buying into that. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if your research has found that or not. But I found for me um, the ability to kind of bounce around is such a huge advantage. Um, and let me tell you why. Whenever I get bad news, 
within seven seconds, maybe 10 seconds, I'm like, what was I just upset about? <laughs> I'm already, I'm already on to the next thing. So it's such a huge asset um, for me. That said, um, I have found, I don't know if you found this, I have found I'm extremely focused uh, at times, like, like maniacally focused to the point where my wife and everybody um, is upset. They can't get my attention. I'm just so focused on that thing. And I become much more clear and more focused when I'm doing like long distance exercise. I think you're right about, so when you go into that period of deep focus, I would say to anyone listening, just think about anything you've ever achieved that you're proud of, whether it's starting a business, being a good parent, learning to play the guitar. That thing that you're proud of took a lot of sustained energy and focus. Almost all of our achievements do. And when attention and focus break down, as I think there's good evidence they're breaking down because of the 12 factors I write about in the book, what happens is your ability to solve your problems and your ability to achieve your goals starts to break down. And when you're in a chronic mode where you co you consistently can't pay attention, so for you, Joe, it sounds like you're describing you have periods of being able to skip around that's fertile, and then you have periods when you can focus deeply, which is a really useful interchange. But when you lose that second bit, when you lose the ability to have periods of deep focus, that what, what happens is, the way I would put it is you almost become a kind of stump of yourself. You can sense what you would have been, but you feel like you can't quite get there. And I think you went to a really important one about exercise, because the last quarter of my book is about why our children are struggling to focus and pay attention. And this, I think, is the most devastating part of this. One small study, for example, backed up by a wider body of evidence, found that a typical American college student now focuses for only 65 seconds. A different study by Professor Larry Rosen, they just observed college students when they're focusing and they found they couldn't focus for more than a few minutes without breaking away. Now we can all see why that's a really big problem. So I write a lot in the book about why this has happened to our kids and what we can do about it. And one of the causes is exactly what you say. We have enormously deprived our children of exercise. Only 73% of elementary schools have any form of recess, for example. And there's overwhelming evidence that, ex I know this is a bit of a no shit Sherlock discovery where you think, well, why did we need scientists to tell us? But usefully scientists have discovered it. That if the single best thing you can do for kids who can't focus is let them go and run around. They'll come back much better able to focus. We are the first human society ever that has tried to get children to sit still for eight hours a day. And it's a disaster for their attention and focus. It's obviously a disaster for their bodies in all sorts of other ways. And there's a, there's a solution to this. There's all sorts of solutions. And your work is obviously part of the solution, Joe. There's all sorts of solutions. But I really helped to understand it when I, I spent a lot of time with a woman called Lenore Skenazi, who's a total hero. I think you would love her work as well. And anyone listening, I would really recommend you think about this in relation if you've got kids. Anyone listening who's, got, who's a parent. So Lenore grew up in a suburb of Chicago in the 1960s. And like all kids in the United States at that time, from when she was five or six, she would leave home on her own at 7.30 in the morning and walk to school, which was about 15 minutes away. She would generally meet up, bump into the other kids, also walking to school on their own. She would go into school. When she arrived at the school, there was a 10-year-old kid whose job was to help the five-year-olds cross the street. She would go into school, she'd be there, and she'd leave at 3 p.m. on her own. She'd wander around the neighborhood with her friends. They would make up games, they'd play, and they'd go home of their own accord when they were about five or six when they were hungry. That is what childhood looked like for virtually all of human history. By the time Lenore was a mom in the 1990s, she was in Queens in New York, that had entirely ended. So her children, she was expected, even when they were 12, to walk them to school, watch as they went through the school gate, and then be there to collect them like a package at the end of the day. And it turns out, so we know there's been an explosion in children's attention problems. There's many factors from the food we eat to the tech we use, all sorts of things we've got to fix. And I talk about them in the book, but let's focus on this one. I don't think it's a coincidence that this collapse in children's attention has occurred at the same time as this profound transformation of childhood. Because it turns out when Lenore or your mum and dad and my mum and dad were just playing freely with other kids, they were learning all sorts of things that are essential for children to develop a sense of focus and attention. They were developing how to persuade other kids. They were developing 
how to figure out what they found interesting and wanted to pay attention to. Some kids are good at balls, some kids like picking flowers, some kids like sitting there drawing, but their free time to explore and play gave them that. This is over, right? By 2003, only 10% of American children ever played outside without adult supervision. So Lenore knew the scientific evidence from all sorts of people showing that this is just a disaster for our kids. They don't get to move, that damages their attention. They don't get to find out what they like, that damages their attention. They don't learn the skills that come from play, that damages their attention. In fact, the only place most of our kids get to explore anything is on Fortnite and other video games. We can hardly be surprised they become obsessed with them if that's the only place where they get to express their deep, evolved instincts. So Lenore runs a group called Let Grow. Everyone listening, go to it, letgrow.org. Really important group. And what they do, Lenore realized, look, you can explain that to parents and loads of parents listening will agree with what I'm saying. But equally they'll think, well, look, if I'm the only parent who sends my kid out to play, my kid's in danger, you know, people will think I'm crazy, the kid will get scared, people might even call the police because when they see a child alone they often do that. It just doesn't work telling people to do it individually. So what Let Grow do, this organisation, is they go to whole schools and whole communities, they team up with them and they persuade everyone to give their kids increasing levels of responsibility and independence, including letting them play outside. And I had this, I spent a lot of time looking at their programmes on Long Island and there was one experience I'll never forget, and I was thinking about it when I was reading about your work, Joe. So there was a 14-year-old boy, a big, strong, strapping 14-year-old boy, who until this program had begun nine months before, had never been allowed out of his house on his own without his parents or an adult, ever. They wouldn't even let him go jogging around the block. Um, and then this program began, and he started to go out of his home, and he started to meet up with his other friends. And what they did is they left the video games behind, and they went into the woods and they built a fort. And he talked about how good it felt to be doing something physical, to be building a fort, to not be interacting with screens constantly. And actually they didn't have any cell phone reception in the woods and he was still glad to be there. And when I watched this boy, it was like, this might sound melodramatic, but it was like he was coming to life. It was like watching, I thought about all these deadened kids I know who don't ever get to explore anything. And Lenore was with me that day. And when that boy left, Lenore turned to me and said, Think about human history. For as long as we've existed, young men and women had to go out. They had to map the environment. They had to explore. They had to build things. And then we took all that away from them. And that group of boys, given a little bit of freedom, what did they do? They went into the woods and they built a fort. There is something deep in us that wants to do these things. And to deprive children of it stunts them in all sorts of ways and particularly stunts their ability to think clearly and pay attention. Does that ring true to you, Joe? I am. Um, I want to partner with that organization immediately because if you think about the work we do, um, we take kids and put them out on a race course where they get dirty and crawl under barbed wire and they don't necessarily get to build a fort. Maybe I have to add that as one of the obstacles at the races, but, but um, oh my goodness. Uh, look, I just wrote a parenting book and, and I had to bring in a, a psychologist because everybody would would read the book, I was afraid, and think that I was a complete nutcase. I was a proponent, I am a proponent, of getting kids outside, getting them do, doing hard work. Listen, we have a farm in Vermont, okay? You're gonna love this, or, or you're gonna, you might hate it because I'm comparing kids and us, and us to animals, to dogs. On that farm, I had eight dogs. If I let those dogs stay in the kitchen for a day or two days and didn't let them go outside because I was afraid, they would go crazy. They would lack focus. They would chew on the furniture. They would fight with each other. As soon as I put them outside, what, what do they do? They run, they play, they get dirty, they attack birds. Like, it's the same thing with kids. We're, at the end of the day, we're animals. You are so right, Joe. And it's funny, there was a moment I promise you this isn't a joke. I'm going to explain someone I met to you and you're going to think that I'm taking the piss. I promise you I'm not. I went to interview a guy called Nicholas Dodman. He's actually a very nice person. He's a professor of veterinary science at Tufts. And he was the pioneer of diagnosing ADHD in dogs and cats. So one day a beagle was brought to him called Emma by her owner. And the owner said, I've got a problem. Uh, my dog just runs around, uh, my dog, he just barks all the time, is really angry, uh, I don't know what's wrong. So he sent the dog, Nicholas Dobman, who's a vet and a professor of veterinary science, sent the dog 
to and the owner obviously to like classes to learn but it didn't really work so when the dog came back he said okay I'm, I've diagnosed your dog with ADHD and we're going to start giving your dog Ritalin so he pioneered giving dogs uh, diagnosing dogs with ADHD when they run around right and so before I went to see him I thought he would say okay so this is a biological problem you know some people are just genetically have attention problems dogs are like that um, actually it's more complex for both humans and dogs but I thought he would just say oh this is these dogs just have a genetic problem but actually what he said very honestly and it's to his credit he said look dogs need to run around most dogs in the United States never get to do that um, yeah I'm giving them drugs because you know what else can I do there was one dog he diagnosed with ADHD who was living in a tiny apartment in Manhattan and was then sent to live on a farm upstate mysteriously it's ADHD entirely went away and there was a phrase he used about these animals so horses in captivity will often engage in an activity called cribbing so cribbing people can look at videos of it on YouTube it's very un uncomfortable to watch it's where dogs sorry where horses um, sort of jerk their heads and breathe awkwardly because in the wild horses will graze they eat grass all the time and it's sort of like mimicking that 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 motion but they can't do it because they're in captivity and again his solution to that was to drug these horses but he said to me look he used a phrase that really stayed with me he said these horses these dogs they have what he called frustrated biological objectives right they, dogs want to run around, horses want to graze. And I would argue a big part of what's happening with our children's attention problems is they have frustrated biological objectives. It's not everything that's going on, there's lots of things. Um, we could talk about food, tech, all sorts of things. I go through 12 factors in the book. But, but children need to run around, and this isn't a hypothetical thing. We can look at the countries that do this. So Finland, the country in Scandinavia, has a completely different approach to this to us. So. Every 45 minutes, children by law have to have at least 15 minutes where they get to run around. Um, they only go to school from 9 a.m. to 2.30. They don't even start school at all until they're seven because they think children should just run around and play until they're seven years old. And what's the outcome? Finland has the most literate children in the world. It has the happiest children in the world. And it has the lowest levels of diagnosed attention problems in the world. So you're absolutely right. The things you're saying that children need to explore they need to run around. They need to grow. And we've created a school system that thwarts that. It's not the fault of teachers. Teachers don't like this either. We created a school system that thwarts that, that bores them to death. They're right to be bored by the system we created. It's completely uninteresting, tedious, get, grills them just for meaningless tests. If you wanted to kill children's attention, you would design the school system we have. We, we deprive them of physical movement. And more than that, of just growth. You know, it's why Lenore, Lenore's organization is called Let Grow. We don't let them grow. We don't, you know, there was another kid I met in that program. I call him LB in the book. They asked me not to use his real name because he's a kid. He was nine. And he, had, he was constantly fighting with his mother because he didn't want to do his homework. He was kind of, you know, falling behind at school. And then they did, for this Let Grow program, they said, okay, what you've got to do, they gave all the kids, they said to all the kids, go away, do something on your own that you, that's just interesting and come back and tell us about it. And that's your homework, to just do something independently. There was one boy, I'll never forget this, little red-headed boy who said, there was a, I said to him, what did you do? And he said, there's a, there's a rope hanging from a tree in my garden and I'd never climbed it. And I went and climbed the rope. And I remember thinking, God, in what previous generation of children would a child have to be given as homework doing an independent task before they would climb the rope that's in their garden? It was such a bizarre... But anyway, this little boy, LB, he decided he wanted to build a raft, a little raft, and let it go off on the ocean in Long Island. So he got a glue gun, he got a load of sticks, he built it, he put together a raft, he took it out to the sea, and it sank. <laughs> so he went back and he built it again. And this time it went off and then he decided he wanted to build an even bigger raft. Then he decided he wanted to build an amphibious wagon. And when he had something he cared about, his attention, which before had been pretty crappy, was suddenly amazing. He started to do much better in classes. He was reading all the time because he was reading about something he found interesting. His whole attitude towards class and school changed because he was given that bit of freedom to find the thing he cared about. And, and it's so maddening. We, this is happening to our own minds. We can feel 
our own attention collapsing, our ability to read deeply, to do our work deeply, to achieve our goals. We can all feel that. It's heartbreaking and a lot of the book is obviously about what we can do as adults, but it's particularly maddening when you see it with children, when you, when you see this happen. And you're totally right that the changes that are happening to us, the collapse of attention, when we see them in children, we literally call them a disease, right? So we've got to get a handle on why this is happening to us. And I think the, the work you're doing is really important for understanding that. I was very lucky, right? I grew up, I grew up with a mom that was forward thinking and I, I have not read your book yet. I don't know the 12 reasons, but I would just suspect uh, exercise, um, diet, finding things you like um, in life, like just exercise and diet alone uh, has to be a game changer. Get rid of the devices, the damn, I'm looking for my phone right now, but these damn devices are killing us. Um, so uh, we have an obligation as parents, as adults, to get kids, uh, go outside. I don't know anything, but I assume these are checking some boxes in your book. Am I right? We'll be right back to this interview. But first, a little bit from today's sponsor, USANA Health Sciences. USANA creates premium nutritional products built on one simple idea. If you feed the cells in your body exactly what they need, your overall health and well-being will benefit. When paired with a balanced diet and regular exercise, taking high-quality vitamin and mineral supplements goes a long way to support your healthy goals. USANA products are developed, engineered, and tested by scientists. They're made with the purest ingredients, and they're manufactured in facilities that operate at pharmaceutical levels, above and beyond what's required by law for dietary supplements. With 30 years of experience, USANA has stood the test of time. Thousands of elite athletes trust their health to USANA more than any other supplement company. Discover the difference at USANA.com. That's U-S-A-N-A dot com. Yeah, no, your instincts are exactly right. And there's a lot of science to back up what you're saying. So, and what your mom in intuitively knew. So let's think about one of the ones you mentioned, which is diet. So I spent a lot of time, this is true for both kids and adults, I spent a lot of time interviewing this, this really interesting new movement called nutritional psychiatry, which is looking at the ways in which how we eat affect our brains and how our ability to mentally function. And what, what, what these nutritional psychiatrists have discovered is the way we eat is really damaging our ability to focus and think deeply in three ways. The first way is, so let's say you eat the standard American or British breakfast, the kind of thing I grew up eating, sugary cereal or white bread and butter, whatever it might be. What that does is that releases a huge amount of energy really quickly into your brain. It's like a shroom, right? And you suddenly feel like you're awake. But what happens is a few hours later, you'll be at your desk or your kid will be at their school desk and you'll experience a huge energy crash. And you experience brain fog, which is where you can't really think very clearly until you have another sugary carby snack. The way we eat causes energy spikes and energy crashes throughout the day, which leaves us with these long patches of brain fog where you just can't think very clearly. And the way Dale Pinnock, one of Britain's leading nutritionists put it to me, is it's like we're putting rocket fuel into a mini It'll go really fast and then it'll just stop. Whereas if you eat food that releases energy steadily throughout the day, as most humans did throughout our history, you'll be able to pay attention much better. The second way is that for your brain to be able to develop optimally, you, you, need, to have, you need to have certain nutrients in your diet. And the way we eat chronically lacks some of those nutrients and supplements just don't make the difference because your body doesn't absorb supplements in the same way. The third way is even worse, which is, it's not just that our diet lacks things that we need, it actually contains things that act on us like drugs. There was a study in Britain in Southampton in 2007. They got 297 kids <clears throat> and they split them into two groups. The first group was just given water to drink and the second group was given water laced with a lot of the food dyes that appear in the food you get from the supermarket, the candies your kids eat, you know, stuff we eat every day. And the second group they were then monitored, and the second group were significantly more likely to become manic, hyperactive, have attention problems, run around. So there are all sorts of ways in which the way we eat is screwing up our ability to focus and pay attention. So what your mom knew intuitively, and from a, how we're, you know going to India and so on, um, was absolutely bang on the money. The move to the, the kind of Western diet that we have has profound, we all know it's caused all sorts of health problems. It's also profoundly damaged our ability to think and pay attention. So, so as parents, I don't want to give away the book because I want everybody to go out 
and acquire your book or, or even if they look if they can't afford it i'll buy the damn book and send it to them right? <laughs> um I, uh number one and you you correct eat healthy and it's just common sense people if you're listening more celery less cotton candy more water less colored drinks is that simple enough yeah but i also want to be honest with people there are all sorts of things we can do as individuals that will um that will massively protect ourselves and our kids but i also want to level with people we're living in an environment that is pouring acid on our attention the whole time or to shift the metaphor slightly, at the moment it's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all day and then they're leaning forward and going, hey buddy, you might want to learn how to meditate, then you wouldn't scratch so much. To which the logical response is, okay, I'll learn to meditate, but screw you, we need to stop you pouring itching powder over me. So there's two levels we've got to respond to this. There are all the individual things we can do, and I talk about dozens of them at an individual level to play defense. But we've also got to go on offense against the forces that are doing to this. And we have to do that collectively. Now that can sound a bit weird, so I'll give you an example from history. It used to be, you'll remember this, Joe, I remember it. It used to be normal that we put leaded gasoline in our cars and people used to paint their homes with leaded paint. And then it was discovered that exposure to lead really damages your brain and particularly damages children's ability to focus and pay attention. So a movement mostly of ordinary moms rose up in the 70s to say, why are we allowing this? Why are we allowing this com these companies to destroy our children's ability to focus and pay attention? And it's important to notice what they didn't demand. They didn't say ban all gasoline. They didn't say ban all lead. They said ban the lead in the paint and the gasoline. And they succeeded. We got rid of lead. As a result, the CDC estimates there's been an average improvement of three to five points in IQ for children across the United States. Now, there are, an, there are things that are like the lead in that paint that are currently severely harming our kids' attention. A lot of them are in social media and in tech. I go into them in detail in the book. And a lot of them, we can protect ourselves to some degree. It's really important to do that. I'm passionately in favor of it. But we also have to, you know, Professor Joel Nigg, one of the leading experts on children's attention problems in the world, said to me that we are now living in what he called an attentional pathogenic environment which is one where we're all going to struggle to focus and pay attention. And one of the solutions to that has to be us fixing that environment together. So we've got to regulate big tech to stop the aspects of their technologies that are designed at the moment to hack our kids' attention and our attention and, and screw them. I talk a lot about what those techniques are, how you can defend yourself, how we can take on these companies. But look, Sean Parker, one of the biggest initial investors in Facebook, said, publicly admitted, we designed Facebook to maximally invade people's attention. We knew what we were doing and we did it anyway. God only knows what it's doing to our kids' brains. That's what he said, right? Now we can take on those factors just like we took on the lead industry. Those companies will never change of their own accord, right? Any more than the lead industry was one day gonna go, you know what guys, I think we've just made enough money. I think we should stop doing this. That's, that's not how it works, right? They will only be as good as the pressure that is put on them. So we've got to fight, and this is true of not just tech, but Across the board, we've got to change the way our school systems work. You can't do that on your own, but we can do it together. We've got to change the f not just what we individually eat, we've got to change the food supply system, which is poisoning us. We for all we've got to deal with air pollution. We're all exposed to air pollution that is causing brain inflammation that is damaging our attention. For a lot of these, we've got to we've got to have the defense for ourselves and we've got to have the offense of taking on those forces. I think we've got to we've got to do both. Just like you know, I would argue we need a, a sort of attention movement to reclaim our minds, right? We are not medieval peasants begging Mark Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies and we own our own minds and we can take them back from the forces that have invaded them and our kids. I love it. How do people find the book? So if you go to stolenfocusbook.com, you can see where to get it as an audio book, an ebook, or a physical book. Also, if you go to the website, you can listen to audio with Lenore, uh, loads of the other experts that I we've talked about in this interview. Um, and you can find out what a whole range of kind of famous people have said about it. But um, but yeah, so if you go to stolenfocusbook.com. Yeah, here's what I want to do. Um, I want to find all the experts you think are applicable to what we're doing at Spartan. And I want to bring all of you at my expense to a Spartan event. I'd love okay? that. Amazing. Yeah, I want you to see what this is because I'm trying to convince people, and it's very difficult, to come out 
and get dirty and do something hard and go to bed early and eat healthy. And I do that by forcing you to get a date on the calendar and then you're scared. And so you do all the things uh, that you need to do in your life, but you haven't been doing. I want you to see it because I think I'm in 45 countries in a non-COVID year. I've got millions of people. Like, if you want to really change the world and you want to get lead out of paint and you want to get people to stop smoking, like, I've got a pretty big reach. Let's do this. Amazing. I'm, I'm down for it, brother. Brilliant. Awesome. Thanks for coming. This was awesome. Do you know someone who needs a little help staying motivated, staying informed, getting or staying mentally and physically resilient? We're here three days every week with a mix of content to help you stay strong. From mindset to nutrition and everything in between. Listen every Tuesday to hear Joe DeSena, Spartan Race founder and CEO. And the rest of the week, join us for DECA, Endurance, and Classic episodes. See you next time. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by USANA Health Sciences, driven to innovate and advance the science of nutrition. Visit USANA.com to learn more about their incredible selection of nutritional supplements and healthy lifestyle products.